All right, everybody, welcome to Martial Arts Radio Live. This is episode six. Yes, this is the sixth, sixth time that we have done this show. First Tuesday of the month, 8 p.m. Eastern, coming at you live on Facebook. I am happy. I'm excited. I made a drink. It's over there. I guess I'm not going to have it. That's fine. It's okay. I had a drink before. That drink wasn't an alcoholic drink. The one I had before the show was, but it was weak. So we're good. Um, Everybody's saying video quality is decent. So good. I'm happy I fixed some things so we can do this. Uh, Why do we do this show? Because it's your opportunity to engage and to have some involvement in what we do with Martial Arts Radio. Because otherwise, unless you're a guest I'm interviewing, you just get to listen. And I like turning the table, so to speak. I like putting you in charge. You're not entirely in charge, but you do have some say. You get the chat, you can chime in here. Hello to everyone who is watching, and thank you to those of you watching live. Uh, As always, but needs to be said again, I want to give a special shout out to Dave Sue for all of his help in putting together this and every other episode of Martial Arts Radio Live. We're really happy to have his help. And we have not one, two, three, or four, but five pages of material that we can potentially go through. And we've got some fun stuff. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. All right. So as always, we review things from the last episode. So if you haven't watched or listened to that one, you might want to go back and check it out. Notable quotes from Jeremy in episode five. I was deployed as a weapon against a goose once. That's true. Self-defense usually involves bullies who weren't checked. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that part towards the end. And uh, I thought we were getting into some good conversation. A bully's intent is to assert themselves over you using the, a minimal, using the minimal amount of force to feel better about themselves. And that minimal amount... That's why standing up to a bully works. Andrew says, Gabe is the man. Yes, he is. I appreciate his help. And if you're watching live right now, which we got a handful of you, shout out where you are. Let's just, you know, I'm not even going to name names. I'm going to say places. I'm going to say places of where you are. And while you're all chiming in with that, it's picture time. Uh, Gabe threw these in and I think this is going to work oh I got a yawn I promise I'm not bored I'm just tired because I get up early alright you've probably seen seen this graphic I gotta wait till it shows up over here so I can center it, focus it can you see it? come on Jeremy from the past come on oh the delay kills me there we go. All right. So it's one of those six panels. It says karate instructed. It says nothing now because it went blank. Um, I, I can't do both. What my friends think I do. What was that one? It's, uh, it's somebody breaking. What my idiot friends think I do. And it's a scene from Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, what white belts think I do. It's Yoda using the force. What brown belts think I do. It's a drill instructor yelling. What I think I do, and it looks like it's uh, a group class, group form from a temple, probably in, well, I don't know enough about Asian architecture to make a judgment, um, and what I really do, and it's uh, standing around yelling at your children. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. All right. Um, this one will be a little bit easier. Zoom in. Martial arts problem number 12. She gave you a romantic hug, but your mind goes to the next logical step, (laughs) which is a shoulder throw. Any of you uh, judoka out there will get this. Um, (laughs) This is a couple panels from the second Karate Kid. No, no, the, the reboot, remake of the Karate Kid. And you've got Jaden at the top saying, but 
I already learned that. And then the instructor, Jackie Chan at the bottom saying, your learning needs more learning as he holds him out over the water. There, screen is going dim. There you go. And then the last one, you're probably familiar with Jeff Foxworthy. You might be a redneck if uh, years ago, and this was early on in our social media, I went through, I think it was 10, and then I did 10 more. You might be a martial artist if, and some of those have changed a little bit, but this says, you know you're a martial artist if, and it's uh, Oh Sensei from Aikido. Everyone you know avoids sneaking up behind you for fear of bodily harm. I bet some of you out there have had somebody come up behind you and tap you on the shoulder and you turn around and your hands are up. Or maybe worse, you punch them. Don't punch them. Good stuff. Good stuff. Keep that tablet handy. We might need it. Who knows where the show is going to go? I don't know. You know you're a martial artist when you imagine yourself defeating bad guys in movie fight scene style brilliance. I do that all the time. I can be out at a restaurant or at the grocery store and just stop and think, what if it went down right now? What would I do? And it usually involves, and I think we did talk about this. I think that's coming up. Yeah, it's coming up. Your homework, you know. What, what could I grab? What would I have handy? You know, and... Uh, Glass wine bottle. That's the aisle you want to get assaulted on because you can get two of them. Just, right? That's the one. I think that's the... That's a great discussion topic. What aisle of the grocery store contains the best defensive weapons? Is there something out there that's better than a glass wine bottle? I don't think there's anything in the produce aisle. Cereal, bags of rice, maybe, hot sauce, spray it in somebody's eyes. You can beat people with frozen meat. I think it's the glass wine bottle. I really do. Watching from Gresham, Oregon. Oh, Frank's saying frozen ham. But how do you swing a frozen ham? I mean, you could throw it and then run away. And since I did say defensive weapon, that would that would apply. I don't know, I like something with a ham. Laura says, what if they attack you with a banana? I don't know what I don't know what you would do in that case. It depends. Is it a frozen banana? Because I don't really feel like I would be that concerned of a regular banana. Even if it's a green banana, if it's a really soft banana, I mean, that's just gross. Andrew says, most grocery stores now sell pots and pans and knives. Okay, that that aisle doesn't count. That aisle does not count. Uh, oh, the cleaning supplies aisle. Yeah, you could throw bleach on people. Frank says that the frozen ham comes with a handle and it's in a net. As someone who does not eat ham and hasn't for a long time, I've forgotten that. I don't remember there being a handle, but that makes sense. I wonder if this is a thing that we could do. I wonder if we could rate the best impromptu weapons given a location. So like grocery store or um, clothing store, shoe store. Well, she, I mean, it's all shoes. You're hitting people with shoes. But I bet we could rank that stuff. I think that would be kind of fun. Maybe we'll do that for next time. Brooms and mops, that's a good one. Vinegar, I think there's a lot there. I think, yeah. Hardware store, that's pretty easy. I mean, you got tons of stuff in there. You got machetes and rakes. I may have said this before on, on air at some point, but I have this whole running list of, of kind of cliche jokes that I want to... Um, Explore in competition. Um, I want to do a weapons form with a rake. I want to, what's another one? 
I want to get up and do like a, a two minute bow followed by a single striking technique and then bow out. Stuff like that. Frank says they have some sharp produce. Good times, guys. Questions that we held over from last time, and we're gonna get into these now, because this is good stuff. And you're gonna have to bear with me on the yawning, because this time of night, talking a bunch, I don't breathe in enough, so. How much can a person really learn from online instruction? This is a this is a dicey subject. This is one that people get really intense over. Online instruction is the only thing I have the time and the ability to do. Online instruction is stupid and you can't actually learn anything. Well, what's the truth? The truth is in the middle and it's a combination of the two. It is unlikely given equal caliber of instruction, that online instruction will be better than in-person instruction. If the student is the same, if the instructor is the same, if the subject matter is the same, I think it's fair to say that learning in person is always going to be better. However, it's not always an option. And there are lots of things that can get in the way of that. Now, up until recently, Online instruction meant you were watching, or, or I should say video instruction, meant you're watching a VHS tape, a DVD, a YouTube video, and someone's trying to teach you something. But now you have the option for live instruction, Skype and whatnot. Is it going to be as good as being there in person with someone? No, I think we all know that. But you can still Get some things done. Have you ever watched a video of someone doing a form or sparring and thought, I see things that they could improve? Of course you have. And if the answer to that is yes, then there is some value in recorded or live instruction. I see some something uh, beneficial there, especially if the person participating has to video themselves and send that to the instructor which if you go back to the old, uh, you know, earn rank online or earn rank by mail, that's what you have to do. You have to record yourself and send a tape. Now, where I think this stuff can be really beneficial whew, yeah, is when you, is in two cases. One, you've already trained a bunch and you're looking to train something else that might be similar. So let's say I've, done Shotokan karate and I want to learn Chidoru karate. They're different, they're different styles, but I can relate what I'm learning in one back to the other. Or you're looking to learn something very specific. And I see this a lot in the BJJ space. Those Brazilian jiu-jitsu people, maybe we have some of you watching. You guys are really good at putting out video content that is on very specific things. You know, here's a whole video of armbars and how the armbar is applied and how you defend against the armbar. And yeah, you might need a partner to work through that. That's a whole separate piece of the discussion. But if you want to get really niche on a particular topic, that's great. If you want it uh, by the same token, Ian Ebernethy does a lot with his Kata Bunkai series in video. Great stuff. Am I going to suggest that's the way you learn that form? No. But if you know that form and you want to go deeper on it, that's a great way to do it. And I love that as an option. Uh, Gabe's saying there's a bow program, a staff program out there that's like that now. I'm sure there's a ton of stuff. But you know what really excites me? Virtual reality with this. I don't think we're even 10 years out before you can take a class with other people and your instructor can watch you. VR coupled with holograms. I don't think we're that far off, 10 years. And imagine, imagine being able to take a class with anybody. Imagine that um, Sensei Fumio Demaro 
offers, you know, two or three, three slots in all of his classes or even some of his classes. And imagine it's a kind of an auctioned off thing where it's 50 bucks and you put on your goggles and he's got somebody sitting there, you know, managing it and you get, no, you're not going to be one-on-one, -on -one, but you get to be there. You get to take a class with Fumio Demer or insert name of person you want to train with, Bill Wallace. Maybe Chuck Norris starts teaching, right? I think it's an amazing, amazing thing, and I'm really excited for it to happen. And I think it's going to completely revolutionize the way we train in Pump Port. If you have thoughts on online instruction, I'd like to hear about them. And I want to point out, one of the things that we do not do and have no plans to do is video on technique. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do this form. Here's how you punch. Because whistle kick is about bringing people together and saying, this is the right way. This is the wrong way. It doesn't bring people together. What will we do? We will and are doing some programming that the first one should be coming out soon that helps you get the most out of your training. You know, whatever that may be. Hmm. Next month, I'm taking a nap before the show. All right, next one. Do public demonstrations really help spread the message of the martial arts? Is there a better way to attract students? I can't say that they necessarily help spread the message. I don't think it hurts. I don't think too many people are out there running demos simply to benefit the martial arts in a broader sense. Every demo I've ever seen or been part of has been related to a martial arts school and that school has been looking for new students. Even if they're not saying, hey, we want you to come train with us. It's, it's an awareness tool. You're getting out there, you're doing things that are cool and maybe getting some people involved and saying, hey, come train with us. That's great. You should do that. Because the more people in martial arts, the better off we all are. I think we all know my feelings on that. It's great. And is there a better way to do that? I don't think there's any one right way or best way to get people in as new students. I think it's a lot of things. And for those of you out there that are part of martial arts schools that we're working with right now, in a consulting sense, you know that that's what I tell you. Your website has to be decent. You have to have ongoing social media. You have to have a newsletter. You should be getting out in the community. There are a lot of ways that you can do this and you should be doing as many of them as you can because it's not just from one thing that people pay attention. Let me put on my marketing hat for a moment. Different theories say different things, but the one that sticks in my head the most. It takes the average person 13 impressions, 13 times seeing a message before they take action. The first time you saw a commercial on TV, you probably didn't run out and buy the thing. It was some number, some multiple of times. And it's the same thing with people, even if they are interested in martial arts. They want to see what's going on. They want to hear from their friends. They want to see your social media. They want to see you in a demo. They want to see all these things before they decide, hey, yeah, let's do this. This is the place that I want to go. Think of it as a, as a net. And you're trying to connect all these things. Social media connects to your website. You're trying to catch the fish. You want more things connected up in the net so you can catch more fish. Stacy says, no, public demonstrations are fun, but that's not the core of what martial arts are. Hard to demonstrate community support and personal growth. Think students talking to friends and coworkers, posting about their classes and what they've learned. It's about relationships, not flash and style. I agree. And the best thing that you can do if you have a martial arts school and you're looking for ways to bring in new students, 
do things that get your students, your existing students, talking about what's going on. If they're excited about what you're doing and what's going on, they will talk about it. If they're not, they won't. All right, more questions. Oh, I'm embarrassed. All this yawning. All right, hold on. I'm gonna get that, that drink that I poured. Maybe that'll help. Be right back. I'm right here. I'm coming back. What kind of amateur hour show is this? What is this one guy in his, in his kitchen sitting on a bar stool with black and white printouts? Yes, yes it is. This is soda water and lime juice. That's it. All right, new questions, new topics. Your homework from last month's episode was to stop periodically or even set an alarm every two hours throughout your day to see what was within reach to defend yourself if you were attacked at that very moment. Gabe says that he is often on his forklift at work. I assume at work. I know it's at work. Which would make for an interesting standoff. Also within reach have been broom, shovels, rope, or straps, a clipboard, and various tools. Andrew says, I currently have a box cutter and drumsticks. Not like chicken, but like as a drummer among a few other things, but that's what I grab. Carla says swords, a mop handle, and a steak knife. <laughs> Stacy is observing the spider plants behind me, and well, I guess up there too. So uh, yeah, I like to grow plants, and uh, spider plants are really easy to grow, so. There are two, there's, there's one there, and there's one over there, I don't know if you can see that one, but. I was attempting a little bit of a between two ferns thing. If anybody's a fan of that show, Zach Galifianakis. Andrew says that he did the homework and many times when the alarm went off, he was driving. He says that's a pretty good way. I would agree. I think it's important for us to take note of what's around, not just because the things around us make good weapons, but just to be observant, what's there? I bet wherever you are right now, if you take a, a hard look at what's around you, you'll see things that you forgot were there. Things that if you brought someone else in, they might notice it. But because you've been around that thing for so long, you've become desensitized. And it's important to be aware, to be present of everything. It can be tiring, but I think it can also be really rewarding. As you get to see on a deeper level. Oh, <laughs> I get it, Stacy. I get it. Stacy was singing while I stepped away to get my drink. She was singing uh, the Spider Man theme, but adapted for spider plants because spider plants were what was on the screen because I wasn't. As tournament season approaches, or is already here, I guess it depends on where you are, what divisions or events are you looking forward to most? The competition season in the Northeast here um, has a little bit of a, a weather bent. Um, we don't have too many competitions in December. Uh, most competitions are finished up in early November and start back up late January. So we get about a two to two and a half months, not quite a break. And then July and most of August, there usually isn't anything because it's summer break and it's hot. And if you have tournaments in July, people don't go. <laughs> not up here anyway. Stacy's got two sleeping cats and a TV remote as a weapon. Not sure I'd want to use a cat as a weapon, but if you threw the cat at someone's face, that might work. Because cats always land on their feet. So the cat would be fine. And they'd probably, Rawr! that might work. I wish there was more diversity of divisions. You know, when I go to competitions, actually, you know what? Let me say that differently. 
because some competitions have tremendous diversity in their divisions. Uh, the NASCAR circuit tends to have a lot of diversity in their divisions, and I really like that. But it also means you have a multi-day event. I like when even a smaller tournament has, you know, their core divisions. You know, it might be forms and sparring and weapons and or breaking. But they add one other thing. Uh, I was at an event over the weekend and there was a scored self-defense division. I haven't seen that at a tournament in ages. Uh, I've seen flag sparring. I think having something different is really important. I like when competitions do that. They bring in different stuff. And for me, I like watching all of it. I enjoy watching someone who has competency with what they're doing and they're able to showcase that. It doesn't matter if it's a, a form that I know. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, two nine-year-old sparring. If they're good at what they do, I enjoy watching them. You know, that kind of uh, relates back to the term Kung Fu, right? We've heard on the show from a number of Chinese martial arts practitioners that Kung Fu doesn't mean martial arts in, in any way. It, it's, it's the notion of mastery of something that you're doing. And I really did that. I think that's a great way to look at it. If you were given, and I would love to hear answers from those watching. If you were given an incredibly valuable martial arts item, say a uniform or a belt or a weapon, would you use it or display it? I think it would depend on what it was, but I think I'd be more inclined to display it. If it's a, a valuable uniform, it's probably valuable because somebody wore it. And if I had it, it would be because that person meant something to me, whether that be someone with some celebrity or someone that I really looked up to. Same thing with the belt. A weapon, if it's valuable, it's probably either special in the way that it's made, and I'd be afraid of damaging it, or special because it's older, and I would be afraid of damaging it. I'm not one to not use things. I'm not one to say, you know, this is the... Uh, oh, I've got a bottle of wine over there sitting on the counter. I'll take that as an example. I know people who will buy really nice bottles of wine and never open them. I inherited from my grandfather when he passed away a couple Prohibition era bottles of whiskey. And I brought one of them to a, uh, a reunion and we all had some and it was great. I mean, that, that bottle was worth hundreds of dollars. Right? I priced it. But I wanted to share it with people. And that's, I, and I, I like doing those things. I like sharing things with people. I like being able to say, here's this special occasion. And so if I had a, let's say, let's say somebody dropped a pair of uh, boxing gloves in the mail and Chuck Norris signed them or something, I'd use them. Maybe not all the time, but I would use them. I have no problem using them. They would probably punch through walls. I'd be like the Hulk, Chuck Norris signed them. Frank's writing in. In the last episode, I mentioned in Muay Thai that we don't use belts. I asked tonight at class. Turns out we use arm sashes. I believe Gabe inquired about that. That makes sense. When I think about the Muay Thai fighters I've seen, they do have ties on their arms. I think I've seen them at the elbow. And they're not generally wearing enough that a belt would make sense. The belt is to hold your uniform clothes. And if they're not wearing a uniform, you wouldn't need that. Stacy says the Northeast Open, shout out to Master Adam Grogan, did self-defense division choreograph team demos, but really like, oh, they got people right in, but I really like the paired synchronized breaking. Yeah. 
I enjoy watching anything synchronized. Synchronized forms is great. And the more people, the better, because you can really tell who spends the time practicing. If you don't use it, the, the more recent question, it's just a thing. My day-to-day -day China plates were from her grandparents' wedding china from the 30s. That's really cool. Gabe says that their league in the Northwest is introducing Team Kata for the first time this year. That's awesome. Loris replying to Stacy, USBA, WBA events are always different. The last one I competed in 10 different events. Expensive, but fun. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, you gotta mix it up. You gotta mix up your training. You gotta mix up competition. You gotta mix up all of it because it just gets stale. Why do you think we're doing this? We're mixing it up. You can't do the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And you can and you need to, right? Where was that That graphic, right, from the beginning? Looks like your learning needs more learning. Doesn't mean that you replace all the repetition, but you do have to sprinkle some variety in there. You know, it's like the, uh, it's, the it's the syrup on the pancakes. Pancakes are, you know, they're good, but the syrup makes them better. Hello, Matthew. All right. We all have our favorite uniforms, and of course, it's always fun to get new ones. But how long have you had your oldest uniform? Oh, man. All right, I got a couple uniform stories for you. So, when I was getting ready for my black belt, You know, there's a few months ahead. I started really practicing. And there was a joke that I was, my mother was asking me, and people were asking me, you know, are you going to do anything to celebrate if you pass your black belt test? Or my mother's saying, you know, what do you, you know, I'd like to get you something special because, you know, I've been training for 11, 12 years at that point. And I said, yeah, I want a blue gi. And I grew up in karate. And it was a joke because we wore white geese and once you earned a brown belt, you could have a black gee. That was it. And I wanted a blue gee. And I didn't think anything of it because it's a blue gee. Well, I passed my black belt test and during at the presentation at class the next day, it was the next day. I was presented with a blue gi. And I still have that. So that's... I think my test was in April. So coming up on 24 years. <laughs> uh, the other really old one I have um, was my competition uniform. So that goes back even a year prior and both pieces of it were used when they were given to me. It was from somebody else who was training in the school that had come to come into our school from another school, and they just happened to fit me very well. And other than one, I think one competition two years ago, I've worn that uniform every time I've competed since. Because it still fits. Because I haven't grown. So I want to know from you guys, what what's your oldest uniform? I still wear the same black belt. I'm trying to think. I, I my my closet, my uniform closet, like right there. And I'm running through it and thinking, what else is in there? I've got some stuff that I've saved. I've got my first jujitsu gi. At least the pants. I think I tossed the top, but I still have pants. That's 12 years old now. I like old uniforms. I think they're fun. I've got uniforms. I've got samples, things that um, factories have sent in, things we've tried. I mean, I've got a whole cataloging system of old stuff out in the warehouse that. Uh, 
It's fun. I hope to hope to take some of those ideas and bring them out in new uniforms somewhere in the future. If you had an hour to kill, and you were going to do something martial arts related, would you watch something, pick up a book, train by yourself, or do horse stance while reading or watching? And every time I see horse stance now, especially with that graphic, it sounds like your horse stance needs more horse stance. I'll come back to that in a second. Jenny says she still has the second pants she ever bought from when she was 13. And uh, I'm not going to ask Jenny how old she was. But she's been on the show, and we can do a little bit of rough math, and I know that it's... Uh, it's been a little while. She's had those pants for a little while. If I have time to kill, it's rare, you know, it's it's rare that I'm going to spend an hour training on my own. In fact, I'll be honest, I don't remember the last time I spent an hour training on my own. I do better with small blocks of time if I'm training on my own. Because I'm in this environment here where there's always other stuff to do. And I, I'll, I'll admit, I feel guilty. I feel guilty if I'm not working. I feel guilty if I'm not cleaning. I feel guilty if I'm not, you know, spending time with the cat because she's lonely because I'm always working. So if I have a couple minutes, you know, I'm kicking things. I mean, I'm just, I, I don't think there's a surface in this house I haven't kicked. I'm constantly kicking and, and playing with distance and playing with angles. And it's the only thing that keeps me sane and keeps my skills up at all because of the frequency. <laughs> Gabe says uh, Jenny bought those pants a while ago. <laughs> he's not gonna he's not gonna say how long. Good man. Laura says if she has an hour, she'll smash boards and then have a bonfire afterwards. Great idea. All right. And what would you do if you only had 10 minutes? What if you didn't have an hour if you had 10 minutes? 10 minutes is great for running through a form a handful of times or practicing some kicks. We've got, um, you know, so it's no secret, we're working on the strength and conditioning program. And then uh, there are other programs coming out. And while the strength and conditioning program is primarily based around having an hour uh, to work out, these others that I've got playing around in my head, they're not strength related. Uh, you'll be able to do a lot in 10 minutes. So stay tuned. Frank says he has a more physically demanding job, so he has no problem resting around the house. <laughs> for 10 minutes, Laura says she would smash boards and save the wood for a bonfire later. Hello, Kevin. All right. I spent some time, this is Gabe. I spent some time in a country that had compulsory military service and said members, and said mem, let me try this again, reading. I spent some time in a country that had compulsory military service and said members carried their weapons with them everywhere. Consequently, their crime rate was rather low. We are not going into a conversation about guns. Don't worry. Do you think wearing martial arts uniforms or clothing would deter, incite, or have no effect on violence? Let's imagine everybody who does martial arts is walking around in their uniform. Let's assume they're also wearing their belt, if they wear belts. It's an interesting mental exercise, because obviously it's never going to happen. Would there be more, less, or the same violence? I don't know if it would lead to more violence. I think it would definitely lead to more harassment. And my gut instinct is that harassment is more likely to lead to violence. There might be a portion of the population that would stay away from people because they look weird wearing that stuff out in public. Oh, by the way, I definitely wear those blue gee pants to high school uh, twice. And I would have worn them more, but they didn't have pockets. Um... I don't know. I really don't know.
I'm going to have to think about this one. Because I, I, I can... I think it would, it would have... I think it would increase violence. But I'm not so stuck to that idea. I want to consider it. So Gabe, let's make a note. Let's... Uh, we can talk about that more next time. Stacy says, I think it would incite. It would lead to more. Show me what you can do, Karate Kid. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I don't think it would be an overwhelming difference. I don't think people would be targeted uh, for violence, but I think, you know, bullies, right? And I don't think that the deterrent... from others would be enough to offset. All right. Laura agrees to my comment on the harassment and the constant, are you registered as a lethal weapon comments? Yeah. Let's move on from that one. I know someone with multiple black belts, one of which is in Japanese Kabuto weapons. But when he told me about it, he added, if that counts as a black belt. Just wondering if you, if some don't consider weapons only styles as complete systems. What do you think? I don't know anyone who has rank in Kabuto that did not start with an empty hand style. And I think that that's where it comes from. Most of the people I know, well, in fact, everyone I know who has tested and ranked in a weapons style has started with some kind of let's say more conventional martial art, and that became a secondary thing that they were training. There was, a, uh, there was an organization I'm familiar with in the Northeast, and I know quite a few people from different schools who have rank and train with these people. And I've tried to get them on the show, and really want to have them on the show, but hopefully someday. And yeah, it's to my knowledge, because I've not trained in it, so forgive me if I'm completely off base here, it's not a complete style. It is exclusively around weapons. But I kind of see that as, um, even though we might apply the same ranking terminology to it, I see it more as, as like, um, in academics, kind of like a certificate program. You know, a, a bachelor's degree is broad. You might take a vocational or a certificate program to specialize in something. It doesn't mean that that education is in, is is less than. It doesn't mean that your qualifications are not the same. It just means that the body of knowledge is different and intentionally so. And honestly, I wouldn't be opposed to seeing more of that. You know, instead of having this, these grand esoteric vague ranks, you are a sixth degree black belt. Okay, great. What's that mean? Well, I've achieved, I've completed this 400 hour certificate in Eskrima, and I've completed this five year apprenticeship in Jiu Jitsu and this and this. And okay, now we can actually dig in what is it that you've done to achieve that rank. I don't think we can continue the rate that we're going with rank because we're going to have people. I mean, there are people right now, younger than me, that are, that I know, that are seventh degree black holes. Are you going to keep training in the next 40 years? Are you going to spend 30 years, 20 years as a 10th degree black belt and not progress? Some people might do that, but this is where some people start adding stripes. It's going to get crazy. It's going to get diluted. Stacy says, Six Sigma black belts are not black belts. Yeah, that's a weird thing. I don't like that they co-opted our methodology there. And she says that as someone who is working for certification in Lean Six Sigma for healthcare. I don't really fully understand what that means. At one point I looked it up, but I forgot. They're the stuff of movies, myths, legends, and masters. Challenge fights. Did they really happen? Should they happen today? What are your thoughts? 
Matt says, I think it would depend on the situation. At one point, I was running a school in the inner city, and outside people would come in to start a fight or a challenge. Happened a few times a week. So I wrote up a special waiver, charged them whatever special I was running, and allowed them to step on the mats. Very few went for it. Had its downside, too, but I enjoyed having it. <laughs> He's saying a lot by saying nothing there. Gabe says that he thinks the dilution of rank will motivate some to preserve the traditional, and I hope he is right. A famous example of a challenge fight. Most of you have probably heard of this one, and you may have heard different interpretations, because, of course, the person recounting this was not there, at least to my knowledge. An excerpt taken from an interview posted on YouTube with Linda Lee Caldwell, Bruce Lee's wife. Her words on a challenge fight Bruce Lee accepted with Wong Jack Man in Oakland in 1964. The martial artist in San Francisco Chinatown wanted to challenge Bruce to a fight. When they came over, there was no bow. They just faced off and went at it. Bruce threw the first punch and it did hit Wong Jack Man around his eye. Bruce started to use a series of straight punches and Wong could not retaliate. Wong turned and he started to run and Bruce was just after him. Wong went down on the ground and Bruce was instantly over him with a fist raised and said in Chinese, do you give up? And he said, yes. And that was the end. Now, according to other witnesses, that fight lasted 20 to 25 minutes and ended only because Bruce Lee was terribly winded. The reason for the fight is also debated. According to Linda and Bruce's family, the fight happened as a result of threats that came from those who disapproved of Bruce teaching Kung Fu to non-Chinese practitioners and wanted him shut down. I could totally see. While it is true that others disapproved of Bruce teaching anyone who would come to him, According to others, the fight took place as a result of a challenge that Bruce gave that he could beat anyone after a failed one to punch demonstration. I think like most things, this stuff gets romanticized. I've heard stories. We've heard plenty of stories on martial arts radio. Plenty of people attacked. But it rarely stems from a challenge because the majority of martial artists at least in my observation, and I've talked to quite a few of them, aren't so keen to get into a fight. Does this stuff happen? Sure. Does it happen more than we probably talk about? Probably. Gotcha. Gotcha, Stacy. Six Sigma is business efficiencies and systems that were developed in Japanese business. If you've ever learned another language, you know you're getting proficient when you dream in that language. Has anyone ever trained or fought in their dreams? Stacy says she's tested in her dreams. I have. I have had huge battles in my dream. And I won't go into the details because I don't know how to tell the story without getting into the real personal stuff. But let's just say I was winning. I hope there are others. It's funny, I was just having a conversation earlier today about dreams and how infrequently I have them and, and remember them. And most of the time if I have a dream. And even if I remember it when I wake up, I don't remember it more than a couple hours later. But this dream that I'm thinking of, I remember very vividly. And it was years ago. Sometimes I wonder if that one was a dream. If you had to boil it down, what are the three most important aspects to being a good or successful martial artist? Mm. I like that one. Humility, persistence, passion. I'm not sure passion is the right word, but I'm looking for, I mean, you can. You can be persistent at something and just not put in a lot of effort. Effort, 
humility for sure, persistence for sure, because you've got to you have to empty your cup and you have to keep going, but you have to make sure you're trying hard. I think if you do those three things, I think you're good to go. You got like an ice storm going on out there or something. Frank's seeing self-control. I think humility accounts for that. Maybe not. The more time I spend training, the more I talk to people on the show, the more I believe humility is absolutely critical. And it's something that I don't know that we're always good about teaching. It's something a lot of martial artists, I think, figure out. You know, you get 30 years in and realize there are people who are way better than you. You can't really help but be humble. I've been humble enough times. Yeah, you got to keep going. Uh, Gabe suggesting determination. I think that's on the list. I think it's a big list. I mean, boiling it down doesn't mean that in... When we use the term boiling it down, we're assuming that we've got everything. But if we had to only pick three, I think those are the three I would pick. But there are plenty of other things. You know, Taekwondo has got its five tenets. And other martial arts have some of these things codified. And I think that that's there for a reason. I think there's a recognition that these things are important. And if we know what's important, we can work to better those skills. Laura says, self-control is something you learn with the martial arts and often not something you have when you start. Ooh, I like that. If there's something you don't agree with about how your martial arts school or tournament is being run, do you leave or stay and try to fix it? How long do you stay before it's not worth it anymore? Like anything else, it's a value proposition. What are the consequences of leaving? Now, I have been to tournaments where I have wholeheartedly disagreed with things that were happening. But it would have been incredibly disrespectful to have done anything about it on a bigger scale. And the fallout from that was not worth it. I have no problem speaking to a referee that I think is either in over their head or just, you know, phoning it in that day. And I have. I don't like that. But I try to do it respectfully. Well, at least I do it respectfully. It's not always taken respectfully. When it comes to a school, how big of a deal is it? Is there any person out there who does everything the way that you would do it? Probably not. But hopefully the big things are being handled in, a, in an appropriate way that you can get behind. And it's a little stuff that you disagree with and you let it go. I would imagine anybody out there with a business partner or romantic partner, you don't agree on everything. You find a way to work through the little stuff or you let it go. Same thing with this. You're, it's not all going to be a, a complete overlap in ideas. And a couple quotes as we head out because it's been nearly an hour. The ultimate aim of martial arts is not having to use them. Miyamoto Musashi. How would you explain this to someone who doesn't train or doesn't understand why it's important in the martial arts? I bring this back to my definition of martial arts. If you look at the grammatical construct, martial arts, the noun is art. So what is my definition of martial arts? Uh, personal development through the lens of... Personal development through the perspective, from the perspective of combat. There we go. It's not about fighting. It's never been about fighting. Fighting is about fighting. Being a warrior is about fighting. Being a martial artist is about using fighting concepts 
to become a better person, to grow. And we've had a couple episodes that are coming out that talk about this warrior ideal and the fact that, yeah, a warrior goes to war. But what does a warrior do when there's no war? Continues to help their people. The, I'm proud of a lot of things for my time training. The thing I am most proud of is the fact that I have never had to be in what I would call a real fight. And I hope, I hope that I can always say that. I never want to use my skills in that way. And it's not because I, I just don't want to get hurt. And I don't want to hurt anybody else. Nobody wins. The only way you win a fight is by avoiding And the last quote, this one from Kishin Funakoshi, spirit first, technique second. Completely agree. I feel like this is pretty easy to understand when it comes to self-defense and even sparring, but how do you apply this to forms, basics, or other aspects of the martial arts? You know what? Let's unpack that next time because that, I want to spend more time on that than we have right now. I don't, I don't want to dig into a possibly 10 minute topic and rush it because it's nine o'clock. No one gets along all the time. Stacy's going to bed. So here we go. The sixth installment of Martial Arts Radio Live. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for watching. If you're listening later on, maybe you'll join us next month, first Tuesday of the month, 8 p.m. Eastern on Facebook. If you like this stuff, join us on YouTube, weekday mornings, 6.30 a.m. Eastern for First Cup, where I have my first cup of coffee. Not, not dissimilar to me. You know, there's a bug in it. Oh, gross. Um, there's no bugs in my coffee, hopefully, but uh, not dissimilar to, to that. It's a kind of anything goes Q&A format, shorter. So I'll be doing that tomorrow. Have a good night, and I'll talk to you soon. Train hard, smile, have a great night.